So um, no disclosures here, I'm gonna skip through this part here. As you know, many patients with MSA have significant lower urinary tract symptoms. 96%, um, my practice is 100%. Everyone I see has got a problem. That's why they're there. And the, the, the variety of problems can really range from having difficulty with avoiding to urinary frequency and urgency to complete urinary retention. The really most important part, I think, of uh, patients with MSA coming in to be evaluated in any neurologic disease is really the evaluation, understanding what the real problem is, uh, and trying to pinpoint what the exact bladder issue is going to be. And of course, you do this with a good history and physical examination. We'll often have patients do a voiding diary. I typically would do an intake voiding diary for a couple of days where people keep track of what they drink and what they put out so I can see how often they're voiding, what volumes they're voiding with, both day and night, so we get some objective evidence of kind of what's happening at that time. Because unfortunately, oftentimes we're kind of poor historians, but it gives us also a way to measure uh, how things change over time. We like to check a post-void residual. Patients with MSA as compared to patients with Parkinson's disease typically have more issues with bladder emptying problems. Um, so a post-void residual is after you've voided in the restroom, you check a residual to see what's left over, and then that's how much we get a sense of how well your bladder is actually emptying its contents. And so that's helpful for us. And uh, for those patients where we, or at least certainly I don't get a good sense of what's going on, we can do a more sophisticated testing, something called urodynamic testing. It's a little bit invasive, so we don't kind of jump to this right away. Um, this is basically a study where catheters are placed in different orifices, uh, so not the most fun test for most people. Um, and we try to assess what's happening to the bladder uh, while it's filling and while it's emptying to get a sense of actually what's going on so we can sort of pinpoint and direct our treatments. Our goals of treatment are really going to be to relieve symptoms, so we're trying to improve or decrease the symptoms that are bothersome to the patients in doing so, hopefully improving the patient's quality of life. And also for me as a urologist, what I worry about, uh, the whole urinary system is sort of interconnected. So what you really want to do too is protect the upper urinary tract, because you have to have the kidneys to live off. Obviously the bladder issues are going to be uh, bothersome to you day to day, but how they also affect the kidneys can be problematic, and we want to make sure we protect, protect the bladder. So this is just sort of an algorithm and how we typically will evaluate patients. Um, here at the top part, you're really trying to rule out other diseases. When patients come in from urinary, with urinary symptoms, what you're really trying to do is, obviously if they have a neurologic disease, it may be due to the neurologic disease, it may be due to something else. And you don't want to jump to the conclusion that it's just the neurologic disease. So you want to make sure there's no other issues kind of going on as you're evaluating them. As you kind of once again rule out other abnormalities, once again, as I talked about during the evaluation, you may end up needing to do a post-void residual, checking how they're emptying, as well as this urodynamic testing to, to pinpoint a little better about how they are, empty, you know, how, what their bladder is doing as they're, they're being filled and how, what it's doing when it's emptying. And you kind of end up with a couple of different potential scenarios. Um, one of the scenarios is everything's seemingly okay, symptoms are not particularly bothersome. You can kind of, kind of watch and wait and kind of observe that patient over time. If their symptoms aren't overly bothersome, they're emptying their bladder well, uh, we can watch that. Sometimes if they're just minimally bothersome, you can do things like uh, pelvic floor therapy or behavioral therapies like tie and voiding, et cetera. So non-invasive therapies to start off with. In those patients, and we see that they're emptying their bladder well, so they're not retaining the urine, but they have symptoms of what they consider overactive bladder, which are symptoms of urinary frequency and urgency and urgent continence. Um, these are patients who you would typically treat uh, pharmacologically with anticholinergic, anti-muscarinics. Um, that's kind of thirst line therapy along with behavioral therapies. Beyond that, there's other treatments such as using Botox, which we've seen in other organ systems here, but using it in the bladder where we can inject it directly into the bladder wall. There's different nerve stimulators that we use, uh, sacral nerve stimulators as well as posterior tibial nerve stimulators, which may be helpful. And so that is, those would be sort of the weakens or third line therapies in urology for those symptoms. It gets trickier when patients have uh, these same symptoms of urgency frequency. So we think of their bladder as being somewhat spastic, perhaps. 
and their bladder is not emptying well, so they're, con they're, they're holding large residuals. And these patients, you may need to work, we don't have great medications to really get the bladder to squeeze better to empty. Um, so oftentimes, most of our work is done at the urinary outlet, where uh, mostly in men, they may be obstructed with a prostate that's enlarged also. Um, so there's medications that we can use, alpha adrenergic receptor blockers, to basically relax the bladder neck, or sometimes even uh, different things like a prostatectomy, from some patients if their bladder is functioning normally um, because oftentimes the medications like the anticholinergics can put patients who already have a poorly functioning bladder into retention or they may be retaining more. Um, thirdly, there's also patients where they just have just large post void residuals with, in other words, they're not emptying their bladder very well, they don't have any urinary uh, uh, excuse me, urgency symptoms or bladder overactivity, and then we just have to figure out a way of trying to empty their bladders. The hard part is when the simple therapies are done. There are a, there are a number of other therapies which can be considered with intermittent catheterization. That means catheterizing yourself once in a while to basically empty your bladder, indwelling catheters, and there are more significant reconstructive procedures after that, and we try to avoid those if we can, but they may be necessary in trying to maintain a quality of life. So project, my, my talk's a little short here um, to make up some time. Um, we can take some questions once again at the panel. It's a good time if you have any specific questions about this. Um, overall, my conclusions are that, you know, obviously patients with MSA have a lot of bothersome lower urinary tract symptoms. Um, the important part is characterizing these symptoms in my mind so we can try to uh, pinpoint what kind of therapy is best. And of course, there's a number of different treatment options now. There's more than there have ever been. They're not all perfect, but I think once again, the goal and for most people is trying to, uh, try to improve your quality of life. Okay, thank you very much.